Welcome back to the Manage to Win podcast. I'm your host, David Russell. Today's episode is sponsored by Habitly.com, where you can learn the habits of highly successful people. So what does that look like? It's people skills, soft skills, how you communicate with one another, how you avoid conflict, or if you're in conflict, how do you get out of it? If you're angry, how do you calm down or avoid getting angry? How do you manage meetings? Think if you could get back a half an hour, an hour, five hours a week, something like that, just from simply managing meetings better. We've got that all on Habitly.com. Go check it out. Seven days free. You can't go wrong. Today's episode is with Rob Ferguson of Ferguson Alliance. And Rob goes and works with family businesses. And he has helped companies achieve 10 times growth, done more than $100 million in acquisitions. He's just focused on family business. If you've got a family business, you definitely want to listen to the podcast. If you don't, there's still some great tips here for other leaders. Let's dive in. Rob, welcome to the show. You've got a unique uh, thing that you're doing in business where you're only serving family businesses, apparently. I'd really like to talk about that. So um, would you please introduce yourself to the audience and then we'll dive in. Yeah, you bet, David. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. Um, My name's Rob Ferguson. Uh, I've been uh, in business for, let's see, I'm probably going on over 40 years. I spent most of my career working in institutional businesses, either private equity sponsored or public companies. And um, it was about 12, 13 years ago, I started uh, as a board member for a family business. And the more I worked with family businesses, the more I fell in love with those businesses. And uh, so 12 years ago, I founded Ferguson Alliance, and uh, we are a boutique uh, business advisory firm that helps um, middle market family businesses reach their goals and aspirations. Well, that's great. I, my understanding is because we have a, a local company that does that that I'm aware of um, here in the Sacramento area, but but you're national. And but my understanding is it's it's really hard as far as succession. You know, the the, the family businesses that want to stay a family business, yeah. uh, they they seem to trip a lot as they get bigger and last longer type of thing. Has yeah. that been your experience? Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, <laughs> even when you look at some of the the uh, statistics of common research. If you go back 50 years, the average life cycle of a family business was 62 years. Today, it's 24 years. So that wow. li- so that life cycle has really come down. Now, family businesses' life cycle is longer than S&P 500. They're about 15 years. But it's because of that, as I was starting to do research on family businesses, that really inspired me to figure out why is that? Um, and mm-hmm. Why that is, is quite honestly, it's they trip up on generational succession. And so that's really where we we focus and our expertise is around is helping helping guide our family clients uh, through that generational succession process. Do you have an opinion? Uh, you know, I'm just curious, Rob, on why that's dropped so significantly from the 60 some odd years down to yeah. 24. Is that... Is that, and we shouldn't go off on too much of a tangent, but is that related to any issues with just the the family unit and the tightness of the family unit and, and how that's working? Or what, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so I believe, David, so non-family businesses have declined as well in their life cycle. So yeah. I believe the real driver is the, uh, is, is the, rep, the rate and the amount of change going on worldwide. When you when we think back 50, 60 years ago, we weren't necessarily a robust world economy. Our, and we think back, our competition was typically localized or regionalized. And as technology has become more prevalent, uh, that's causing change to happen faster uh, than even when I was in business. I, I was in bi- uh, business most of my career without email, without the internet. And <laughs> business leaders today, that can't even imagine what that would be like. Yeah, um, yeah. So I truly believe it's just uh, the business leaders, whether it's family or non-family, being able to be agile and adapt to change. 
that what is what I believe is uh, causing the life cycle of family businesses specifically to be reduced. Interesting. And, and are, from your studies, are there also more acquisitions happening now, too? Because I know some people are just like, that's the way to grow yeah. is, is acquire companies. And so years ago, I don't think there were as many. But it, I mean, you've studied the data. I haven't. What's your yeah, conclusion? So I, I think we see a lot of mergers. But remember, so family businesses are a large employer today. I think 68 percent of all employees work for a family business. Now, Walmart is the, world, the world's largest family-owned business. It's, it's a publicly traded company, but the family still controls the stock, the, okay. the, the, the primary shares. So the, the point being, I think it's um, that life cycles really change. is happening faster than ever before. And I do believe there's probably some increase in mergers and acquisitions but that was that's kind of been happening along the way um i think the biggest impediment to the life cycle has been adopting to change that's what we see when we go into a family business there's first of all i've never had a phone call asking me to come help a family business that was operating perfect uh, it's always <laughs> some issue and those issues typically are going to be around direction for the company. They're going to be around money, okay? And it's going to be also around uh, succession or leadership. And that's that's where the conversations really get started. Interesting. And it, when I was looking over what you do, I noticed you have a prosperity plan, kind of nine keys or steps or yes. something that companies can do. And I, I'm, if you're willing, I'd love for you to kind of walk through those at a high level uh, to kind of introduce our people to that concept. Because whether they're, you know, a family business or they're in a partnership, you know, where it still might be kind of a family business, just multiple families. But, um, you know, some of these things may speak to them and alert them to aspects of their business that they're not focusing on enough that could help them grow more or, or avoid a problem. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks for asking about that. This uh, model that we put together called the Prosperity Plan is basically over the last 12 years of work that we've done. And so it's kind of been on the job learning as to well, what are the best practices that help family businesses succeed and those that aren't successful. And um, so we... Think about a house, or we actually call it a treasury building. And that's that's what our, our model looks like. It's this, it's the family treasury building. And the foundation of that treasury building uh, is the family values and the business culture. So that's the, the foundation. And what we've learned is family businesses are wildly successful, maybe even more successful than some of the more institutional businesses in retaining and recruiting employees because of their culture. And what they've been able to do is successfully integrate their family values into their business culture. So that's the foundation of the treasury building. And then the, the roof of the treasury building, so to speak, we call it, that's the family's prosperity. Well, what does prosperity mean? Every family business that we talk with about what does prosperity mean, it, it's not dollars and cents. It's really more about how are we going to really make an impact with our business, with our employees, with our assets. So we guide the family business to define what prosperity means to them. Certainly the value in, in the business is part of it. But once that family defines their roof, what the prosperity is, then we erect the building, so to speak, with three pillars. And we well, let's let's pause for a moment. Let's yeah. pause for a moment. So let me go back to the foundation where you've got family values, yeah, and then you've got company values, yeah. And so, if I'm understanding you correctly, if they're really going to get this thing launched and it's going to have some longevity, those family values need to be solid, yeah. Because basically, they're going to go do the business the way they are outside the business. Is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. So the, the idea is, is what does the family really stand for? Uh, what, what does the family really value? What are kind of their their mandates that they have as a family 
and which of those mandates should be um, incorporated or integrated into a business culture. And so it, it gets a bit tricky because in most family businesses, we have uh, family members that are in operations or shareholders or maybe both or on the board of directors. So we have to make sure that we um, make a distinction um, when it comes to, uh, let's see, con where it could be contradictory between family values and business culture. So for example, and I can talk to you about this a little bit more in a minute, in the family, right, it's, we, we're gonna take care of the family. And, uh, but when you get into the business, if one of the family members isn't performing, how do you handle that? Yeah. And, yeah. And so that gets into one of the key elements that we have. It's one of the nine elements, of which we, we call it the big question. You have to, the family's got to start off making a decision. And there's a big question that we always start. It's easy to ask, but it's very hard, hard to answer. And that big question is, are you a family first business or are you a business first family? Yeah. Yeah, because it, you want to keep the relationships first. You don't want to have Thanksgiving dinner with some seats empty. Right. Type of yeah. Thing. yeah. Well, so how do you do that um, and get agreement on that up front so there's no surprises? Kind of like I was taught years ago, it's really important to define how you're going to get out of a contract. <clears throat> and it's almost more important than how you get into it. Yeah. Yeah. And so essentially, that's the, the starting ground of where we work with every family. And it's interesting, um, most families will respond quickly like you just did, but they end up in a very different place than maybe where you are. <laughs> because in, in the end of the day, um, there, there's, there's not a right or wrong answer, family first business or business first family. Yeah, yeah. The, where it's wrong is if you're in between, if you're, if yeah. it if it's flexible, oh, we, uh, one day we're going to be family first, and the next day we're going to be business first. That yeah. declaration has to be made. It has to also be defined, and we believe for you to be able to move any, get any further down the road to prosperity. Yeah, and and isn't it important? And and how do they deal with this? They have to make certain they're not treating family members with favoritism, right? I mean, that's right, because that that's going to cause that's going to ruin the culture. That's right. Now, there are plenty of family first businesses and the, and you might think about those. Those are maybe some lifestyle businesses or maybe it's a, a local restaurant where the whole family is involved. Um, there, there's a place for that, which is which is fine. <clears throat> but in the business first family environment, you're going to put the best interest of the business ahead of family. And so that means that if the family member is not qualified to be the CFO, they're not going to be the CFO. Somebody else is going to be the CFO. But in a family first business, if you're holding that job, well, I have to, I've got to employ my daughter. She needs a job. She's fresh out of college. So I'm going to put her into that CFO role. She may not be the most qualified, but because I'm a family first business, but my job is to take care of the family, feed the family. I'm putting the best interest of the family ahead of the business. It's kind of a, the, the nuance there, but once that decision is made, then you're able to start moving down the road to uh, finding prosperity. I, I guess I guess it's a positive that you at least consciously make the decision versus you're trying to tell yourself or your employees that, that you're not showing favoritism, but yes. that person yes. needs to be in that role, although it's clear to many people, if not everyone, that that person's not in the best role. Yes. No, that, that's so true. In fact, <clears throat> when we go through with the families, they end up writing a statement, a, a business philosophy statement. And it's one paragraph. And and uh, typically the leader of the business uh, reads that and disseminates that to the employees. Yeah, yeah. And the employees receive that in a very favorable light when they come forward Obviously, we're we're working with business first families, um, and so as they present that uh, that we're a business first family, and, and this is what it means to us. This is how we define it. Uh, the employees are, um, you know, very satisfied hearing that. And they actually 
get more engaged uh, to hear that business philosophy statement be read. Yeah, yeah. But as as we discussed before, it sounds like we're on the same page. As as family, you really have to have a clear understanding of um, what happens if you come and work for the family business and it doesn't work out because we still want to hug you and, you know, yeah. you're still family. I mean, that's what's most important. But if it's not a fit, you know, I'm, I'm running the business. I need to be honest with you. It's not a fit. Yeah. How do we work out of this and, and work out of it? Not just have you in a role that's not working for you or the company. And still be able to go to Thanksgiving dinner with you. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. That's the trick. And that's what we believe we're 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 pretty good facilitators of those kinds of conversations. I'll tell you a, a story where all of this to me came forward. So it was about 10 years ago. Uh, I was uh, referred to a client down in uh, Florida. And uh, it was two brothers, or it was actually two brother-in-laws. They owned 50% of the business each. And they told me the story of how they got there. They, um, it was definitely a family first business. Um, the, the patriarch of the family founded the business. And uh, the boys after high school went to work in the family business. And they'd been working there for 10 or 15 years. The patriarch ended up in the hospital and he was, was uh, literally on his deathbed dying. Uh, and the boys worked for a salary. That, that's all. The father owned all the, all the shares of the company. Now, this business had gotten to be um, very successful. It was, a, it was about a $75 million enterprise. So we're not talking about a chopped liver business. It was doing very well. <laughs> So the, the patriarch calls the two boys into the ICU room, literally on his deathbed. And he says, boys, I'm going to give each of you 50% of the company. Oh, thank you, Dad. Thank you. This is great. We really appreciate it. And he said, but by the end of the year, you're going to be bankrupt. And then he passed away. He died. So that was <laughs> the setup for these two boys. So the, now they're 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 brother-in-laws, right? And yeah. so they look at each other and they they make a commitment. They make a pact. They, they told me this story. They said, we decided that whatever happened, we were not going to let this business jeopardize our family and our family relationship. And the second pact that they made is we're going to make every decision consensual. So if we didn't both agree on it, we weren't going to do it. So the first year, they obviously didn't go bankrupt by the end of the year. The next year, they continued to have a successful year, albeit it wasn't quite as successful as the year before. Three years later, they found that their revenue was declining by about 20% and profits were declining about 35%. So now all of a sudden, it's not as successful as they thought. They could run it. The key leader that was kind of the decision maker, he was the center of the hub and spoke, so to speak, was gone. And these two boys were trying, they're men, they weren't boys, trying to preserve their pact of we're going to make every decision together 50-50, and we're going to make sure that we're not going to let business interfere with the family. So by the time I get referred into the, the business, it's um, barely breaking even and not doing well at all. And so that's you know, and I met with all of the family members and asked them that very specific question. It took them probably two months to answer it through lots of family debate. Yeah. Well, that's good that you got yeah. them to go through it. I mean, that's right. They went through it. And then they finally, they did make the decision, business first family, and they slapped the table, said, this is how we define it, what it means. And so then the first big decision was, okay, who's going to be the CEO? Yeah. Because you can't have two. In this, in this situation, it just wasn't working. And how are you going to make decisions going forward? And so because they had made the declaration that we're going to be a business first family, we're going to put the business first. One of the brother-in-laws acquiesced and said, I believe he should be the CEO, not me. And I'm willing to let him own these decisions. And so anyway, make a long story short, it, after uh, about another year of um, restructuring the company, changing up some of the leadership principles and putting in some new um, 
operating practices, the company did turn around, became very profitable. Ultimately, um, the uh, family decided to sell the business uh, about seven or eight years later, but they would never have been able to sell that business if they had made some of these, these fundamental changes uh, in their business because uh, they wouldn't have had the value there. Well, it's interesting to note, too, that um, one of the brothers-in-law was humble enough to to say, you know, I think yeah. that the other one should should take the lead. Yes. And yet I'm still going to give it everything I've got. Yes. And, uh, you know, that's that takes a lot of courage um, because I, I don't you know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think he did it out of fear. But no. um I think it takes a lot of courage and commitment to follow through on that family first. And that's, that's a great thing. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure that was a fun, fun ride for you to be involved in and, and help them along because uh, that's a, that's a great positive story, but I got you distracted from the, the, the prosperity keys. plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we only have so much time, so yeah. I don't want to rush you, but let's go ahead. Dive well, in. I mean, you I, want. Well, what we just talked about was kind of the very first, uh, element of our pillar we have so to to erect this treasury building there's three pillars and that that first pillar really and truly is well what is that shared direction or shared vision that we're going for and, and then and then secondly it's it's organizational strength how do you how do you build a strong organization that's our second pillar and then third the last pillar is what we call our system for managing so those three pillars is what holds up the uh the prosperity um, rough, so to speak. And then each pillar has three elements. I just went through the first element uh, called decide. You know, the, that's the first decision you have to make to get to a shared vision because that's that's truly important. That's where we see most of the disagreement with family members is where are we going and how are we going to get there? So, yeah, um, that, yeah, I'm, that's, yeah. I'm curious on the middle one where you talk about the strengths. Now, how much... Yeah time and focus do you encourage them to to uh, build on the existing strengths versus address the weaknesses that might be tearing the organization up yeah well we, we spend a, quite a bit of time there uh we do a deep dive assessment and not just the individuals leading the business um, and the managers but we also look at the organization structure and we look at their operating norms to see what's getting in the way what happens um, in most family businesses, as they're going through their life cycle and they're growing over time, individuals get promoted because they were really good at something. They were a subject matter expert, and then they get promoted. And they, they become a leader entitled, but they don't know how to be a leader. And so that's what we find is we have to help make sure that that's understood. And then we we uh, work with them on developing leadership development plans or perhaps even helping them recruit in some other professional leaders that can fill the gap, depending upon how urgent it is to fill that gap. Yeah, yeah. And uh, going back, though, to my question, um, what, what do you find it typically works out as far as how much you're focusing on, hey, here are your strengths, let's take them to the next level, or hey, you really have to work on these weaknesses um, or they're going to take you out of the game. We try to focus the most of our effort on their strengths. Yeah. You know, how do we make your strengths stronger? Yeah. And, and then what we do is we talk about barriers. You know, what, what are the, what's getting in your way? What are the barriers that are hindering your strengths from manifesting, for being more? We, we find that people are are more open to build on strengths than to try to fix a minor strength is what we call them sometimes. Um, <laughs> and then we, we do, we point out the barriers and gaps. And sometimes the gap or barrier is we just don't have the leadership capacity or the leadership competency to execute this strategy. So we, you know, we use a Socratic method here at Alliance, and so we try not to be the answer people. We just try to be the really good question people and provide tools and provide some some insight to help, help these family members uh, learn as they're going along. 
And um, so that's usually what happens is they discover through our process that we have a leadership gap and it's a competency issue or it's just a pure capacity issue. Yeah. Yeah. So and how does the uh, how does this work to go through your prosperity plan? What what type of time frame does that typically take? And and what if there's any other parts of it you want to bring up? I'm happy to hear about. Yeah, that. so it's a it's a great question. Um, we start off with an assessment first, and that usually takes about two months. And we're looking at the tangible aspects of the business, but and also the intangible. So, um, and we at the end of that assessment period, we provide a list of strengths and a list of opportunities. Our, our barriers that are getting in their way. And with the ownership or the leadership of that family business, we prioritize those into a top two or three that we really want to work on. And we build a roadmap then to build a, a plan. Um, and then once that, so we do the assessment, that's about two months. The planning process takes, it depends on the size of business. Most of our clients are probably around that 50 to 250 million of annual revenue several hundred employees. And so that might take us two to six months to, to really build out that plan, depending upon the size and complexity of the business. And then we go into implementation. And the implementation, you know, we, we find it takes a while to change the culture. It, ta- it takes some time to implement new processes or systems. But that's usually 12 to 18 months. So we're with our clients for a long time, uh, at least a year. Um, many times it could be multiple years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so what else do you find are like, um, what are the biggest challenges that a family business faces, Um, you know, moving forward? It started with a lot of enthusiasm and then there's a lot of hard work. And yeah, now, you know, it's the, 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 the number one issue is vision or direction by far and away. Because uh, when they started the business, whether it was with two brothers or a single sole proprietor, there was a clear view and vision. But as that business grows over time, it becomes, you know, a, a little fuzzy, um, you know, particularly entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have a syndrome called the shiny object syndrome. Uh, so whenever they see a shiny object, they run towards it. And they get distracted very easily. And so uh, that's usually where we run into the vision problem. So just getting that clarified, what the direction of the company is going to be, what's the impact the company is going to have, what does success look like in the future? Um, we got to get that unified. Secondly, is uh, all around money. You know, what's an acceptable level of profit? How do you want to distribute the profits? Uh, how do you want to invest? So you see, family businesses are always, we call it you know, we call it the strategic capital. They're trying to figure out, do we grow? Do we keep control? Or do we go, do we uh, increase liquidity? So no, what, I'm, what I mean is, is they're trying to figure out, yeah, I want to grow, but I don't want to grow at the cost of liquidity, getting distributions every year. Or I want to grow, but I don't want to have to give up any ownership to get that growth. So we're, they, they get um, um, tie, tied up in that conversation. And that's why the vision and the money become the two most primary points of um, uh, problems for these family businesses. Interesting. Interesting. And, and I would, uh, am I correct in my assumption or understanding that the other reason the vision is a challenge is that uh, there may be a change of leadership yeah. or as they grow, it was kind of easy initially, Hey, we're going to solve this problem. But then the more successful you are, the more opportunities you have to get distracted going down rabbit trails with some other business idea. Yeah, no, that, that's right, David. And so that's why when we talk about vision, we're talking 10, 20 years out and we always start first, you know, defining, well, what's the purpose of your business? You know, what yeah. is that real purpose? And then once we talk about the purpose, then we can talk about, well, the vision, what is it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? You know, what's the balance sheet going to look like? You know, describe that. And it's far enough out there that once that purpose and vision is set, 
then as you manage your succession plan, uh, the individuals you have uh, know and understand what that long-term goal is from a vision and purpose perspective. Cool. Well, I, you know, Rob, I, I think we're just getting started, but this is really good info. And uh, we have listeners out there that are running family businesses. Uh, if they want to get a hold of you, what is the best way to do that or at least learn more about what you're doing? Sure. They Drop me an email. It's rob at ferguson-alliance.com. Um, so it's really easy, ferguson-alliance.com. That, just drop me an email and uh, we'll certainly get back to you right away. You can also go to our website, um, ferguson-alliance.com uh, and uh, you'll you'll see uh, a lot of great information. You'll see some of our research. You'll see a lot of our uh, webinar uh, video recordings um, and some testimonials from uh, past clients. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Rob, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, David. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for tuning in today. If you liked the episode with Rob, please subscribe, leave us a comment or a rating. We'd love to hear from you. Love the feedback. And don't forget our sponsor, Habitly.com. There is fun five-minute trainings on there. They're animated with some humor. There are also hour-long or so courses that teach you in greater detail. A lot of opportunities for personal growth individually or as a team. Habitly.com. And stay tuned in. We've got more great guests coming. Bye for now.